Welcome to Information Service Engineering. This is lecture number four, Natural Language Processing, part three. In this part of the lecture, we are going to talk about language models and so-called n-grams. So the basic question we want to answer here is, can we predict a word within the language to form a so-called statistical language model? So what's word prediction? It's quite clear. I give you the beginning of a sentence, to be or not to, how does it end? Clearly be, so to be or not to be, it's quite clear. Or the pen is mightier than the, what's the word that follows? Usually it's sword. Or you can't judge a book by its cover. You see, this is kind of word prediction and we are able to do that. It's also possible in German. So es irrt der Mensch, solange er I leave it to you to find the answer for that. Or, die Botschaft höre ich wohl, allein mir fehlt. You will find it out. I'm pretty sure about that. How do humans now do this kind of prediction? How do humans predict words? So first of all, humans have domain knowledge. So for example, it's clear that you talk about red blood more likely than about a red hat. Because if there is the word red, then blood is rather likely to come because blood is red and heads also exist in different colors. So a specific likelihood is associated with that. Furthermore, you have syntactic knowledge, which means if, for example, a word like the occurs, so you have the, then you know, okay, after that there should be a noun or a combination of adjective and noun. So this is syntactic knowledge because, you know, syntactic rules. And then there is also lexical knowledge. So it's more likely that you are talking about a baked potato than about a baked steak. So usually you don't bake steaks. Okay, so our claim is a usual part or a useful part of the knowledge needed to allow word prediction can already be captured by using simple statistical techniques. So how do we do that? We are using statistics and we are using the so-called n-gram model. So word prediction can be formalized with a probabilistic n-gram model. What are n-gram models? n stands of course for a number and there is a two-gram model which is a bigram model which means you consider pairs of subsequent words consisting of two words so simply pairs to be, be or, or not, to, not to for to be or not to be. Or three grams which are trigrams to be or, be or not, or not be, uh, or not to. So you simply separate then these uh, sentences or the one sentence that you have uh, into consecutive um, sets of, uh, into sets of consecutive words, either two or three. So you have bigrams, trigrams, and for, let's say, four grams, you would use four words. So an n-gram is an n-token of words. And always in an n-gram, the last word, w sub n, depends only on the previous n minus one words. So this is our basic assumption for statistical language modeling that we say, we saw already the beginning of a sentence and we say, okay, the next subsequent word depends on only the words before that we have there. And considering now different kind of models, n-grams, you consider n minus one words as to be determining the last subsequent word. So in a two-gram model, we only depend on one additional word. In a trigram model, we depend on the two subsequent words. And this kind of approximation that we don't take into account all the words that have been before, but only a specific number, a shorter number, this is the so-called Markov assumption. And I mean, in the ultimate case, you only look at the very last word that comes before your word that you want to predict so that you say it's only dependent on one word. However, there is then more ambiguity left. The more words you capture in the sequence in your n-gram model, so the larger n is, the lower is the ambiguity because um, at one point, you know, you exactly determine what kind of word might follow because you rule out with adding more words the possibilities that you have there. This doesn't work completely. However, language keeps 
its uh, ambiguity. We have seen this. There is ambiguity on several different levels, but it's quite clear. The smaller my n is in an n-gram model, the higher is the chance that I have more ambiguity. This means the less uh, exact in the end and the more approximative my model might be. So thus, the last word, w sub n, will be computed from the previous n minus 1 words. So this is what we are going to do here for the problem of word prediction. And these kind of statistical models of word sequences are called language models. So we are talking about statistical language models, and they are usually applied in many techniques in NLP. So for example, in the application of speech recognition. So it's quite clear that with the help of a statistical model, you can decide that computers can recognize speech. It's much more likely than, you know, that somebody said computers can wreck a nice peach or give peace a chance or give peace a chance. Ice cream or I scream. Two birds are flying or two beards are flying. So there are subtle differences and you can solve them with the help of statistical language models simply to look which of the sentences is more likely to be recognized. The same holds for handwriting recognition. So not always you might be capable to really distinguish that this is a specific letter, but by the context, which means the surrounding letters or the surrounding words, again, the language model might help you to give you the right probability to be able then to disambiguate the different possible meanings of this written sentence. So there's the use of statistical language models. Now to do that, to compute this kind of probability, we need a little bit of basic probability theory. First of all, we are talking about trials, which means a trial is something like throwing a dice, predicting a word or something. We need a sample space. So this is the set of all possible outcomes, like for example, all the numbers in the lottery that can win or all the words in Shakespeare's plays. And then we are talking about an event, omega, which is an actual outcome. Usually this is a subset of omega, your sample space. So this means we want to predict the uh, for, uh, a specific word, the outcome that the is the next word, or we want to throw a three as the next number uh, with a dice. So we have to keep in mind that in probability theory, all of our things that we are doing here have to fulfill the so-called Kolmogorov axioms. This means each event that we are talking about has a probability between zero and one. Anything else is not possible. Then the null event has probability, so the null event is that nothing happens, has the probability zero. And the probability that any event happens, so something always happens, is one. And of course, the sum or the probability of all disjoint events, of all outcomes, should sum up to one. These are the Kolmogorov axioms that hold or that constitute the basics of our probability theory now, and also where it holds for our language model. Now let's have a look at the statistical language model. What we want to find out is the probability of a sentence or a sequence of words. So the probability of S, P of S, which is the probability that we have a sequence of specific words, W sub one, W sub two, W blah, 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 blah until W N. So for example, we have the sentence computers can recognize speech. This is the sentence. So we want to um, compute the probability that the specific sequence computers followed by can followed by recognize followed by speech occurs and of course it should be then uh, possible with our language model that we are able to rank sentences and the possibility of sentences for example the possibility of today is wednesday should be higher than wednesday today is i mean of course if you are not yoda sorry for the joke or also today is wednesday should have a higher probability than today is book clearly okay now to compute the probability of a sequence of these kind of events we have to look at the notion of so-called conditional probability so what's conditional probability we are looking at the following situation that we have an event b which occurs under the assumption that another event has already occurred so the event a and you can compute this simply by the probability that both 
events occur divided by the probability that the event that already should have occurred has occurred. So this is conditional probability of B under the assumption that A already has occurred. And then there is the so-called base rule, which is used to determine now or to compute the probability of a sequence of events. And this has been determined by Thomas Bayes already in the 1800s. So Thomas Bayes lived from 1701 to 1761. He was an English mathematician, somehow philosopher, and also a Presbyterian minister, as you see here from the picture. And he is known especially for formula uh, formulating a rather special case, so one special case of the theorem that today bears his names, so the Bayes theorem. Unfortunately, he never published uh, what would become his most famous accomplishment, and it was published only um, after his death. So what's the Bayes theorem? How do I do that? So the Bayes theorem tries to compute the probability that event A occurs followed by event B. And this equals, first of all, the probability that event A occurs at all times the probability that event B has occurred under the assumption that A already has occurred. So it seems quite logical that you compute exactly the sequence of an event like that. So the sequence of two events is not only simply, let's say, the multiplication um, of uh, the probability that A occurs and B occurs, because, because this doesn't say anything about the sequence. What you have to take into account is, OK, first of all, A has to occur. And second one, B has to occur after A. So B has to occur while A already has occurred. So, and the second one here is the conditional probability, and the first one here is the probability of a specific event independently of the other event. And this is the nice thing, you can compute this simply by the base rule you have here. This holds for two events, and you can simply extend it then with a so-called chain rule. So if you want to know the probability that the events A, B, C, D have happened in exactly that kind of sequence, you simply say, okay, this is the same probability like event A has occurred, no matter when, and then times the probability that event B has occurred under the assumption that A has already occurred, times the probability that event C will occur under the assumption that event A and event B have already occurred, times the probability that event D will occur under the assumption that events A, B, C already have occurred. So this is the chain rule. And this you can generalize for let's say n events and then you have here also again the conditional probability that you need to compute the sequence of words which is the probability of a sentence which means then what you do here is <coughs> you compute simply the probability that the first word occurs somehow times the probability that the second word occurs under the assumption that the first word already has occurred and so on and so on and so on until you reach word number n. And you do this then for your n-gram model, according to which n you choose here. And you can simply write this in a nice closed form as being the product from 1 to n of the probability of w sub i under the assumption that w1 until w sub i minus 1 have already occurred. So this means what we are going to do here, the probability of to be or not is simply the probability of 2 times the probability that b occurs under the assumption that 2 has occurred before times the probability that or has occurred under the assumption that to be has occurred before times the probability that not occurs under the assumption that to be or has occurred before. So that seems quite straightforward. The only thing which is just missing is yeah, how do I now determine the probability of the occurrence of these words? So how does this work? And you will see then in the next part of the lecture in language model and n-grams number two, that we can make use of large text corpora and simply count words there and their co-occurrence to come up with an estimation of the probability how likely it is that one of these words occurs in a specific sequence. So this is what we do then in corpus linguistics. So we are 
looking at large corpora of texts that we use as a basis for statistical analysis for our language models. And how to do that, you will see in the next part of the lecture.